and verse number 12. We're looking at victory in Jesus as our theme for this sermon series. And we're looking at victory over affliction that comes into our life. The Bible says in verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of the sufferings, of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word We're grateful for the opportunity we have to study it and and to look to it. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we look at this passage of Scripture. I pray that you would teach us, and I pray that you'd be glorified, uh, Lord, in our response to it. Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to look to your word. I pray that you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray that your word would fall on good ground, that it would grow in our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. It was Oswald Chambers who said, suffering is the heritage of the bad, of the penitent, and of the Son of God. Each one ends at the cross. The bad thief is crucified, the penitent thief is crucified, and the Son of God is crucified. By these signs we know the widespread heritage of suffering. Now, the first century church was common to trials and afflictions. In fact, Peter is writing this passage of Scripture, and he's writing them to let them know that afflictions or tribulations or trials are a common thing. They're not a rare thing. They are indeed a common thing. As we define adversity, It is like a a rock hitting the surface of a pond. And immediately, the calm surface is uh, disrupted by the percussion of the rock hitting the calm surface and sending ripples out from the point of impact that affects the entire pond. Now, we always want in our life our pond to be calm. No one wants to have their lives disrupted. No one wants afflictions or tribulations that come into their life. Someone once said this, that you're either in a trial, you're either coming out of a trial, or you are coming into a trial. The reality is is that afflictions are a part of our life. We cannot escape the trouble that we find in our world. In fact, it is the Bible that says that man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. And so in this passage of Scripture, there's more to it than just Peter writing to the church and saying, hey, just so you know, troubles are going to come. But it's Peter writing to these believers and saying, this is how you can have victory over the troubles that come into your life. I want us to notice some thoughts from this wonderful passage of Scripture this morning. First of all, if you're taking notes, would you write it down? The commonality of trials. The commonality of trials. It says here in verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as, some, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Now, first of all, we have to define what Peter's talking about. You see, adversity is expected in the Christian life. The idea there of strange is defined as to to surprise or to astonish by strangeness or novelty of a thing. In, In this passage of Scripture, Peter is telling Christians, hey, listen, you can expect affliction." You can expect trials. 
fiery trials and painful ordeals aptly describe what most of us must pass through at one time in another in an, uh, one time in our life or in another or or one time in our life or another the reality is that some more frankly than others we think of job and all that job had suffered in his life but he doesn't just talk about the fact that these are trials he doesn't just talk about the fact that these are afflictions but these are fiery trials and the idea here of fiery trials are in reference to, indeed, the refiner's fire. This is in reference of, of God's working in our life. When a metal is refined, it is purified by putting heat to it so it will burn off the dirt, the dross, the impurities, and leave behind the pure metal. And so the Bible teaches us in the Scripture that fiery trials or these refining trials are come into our life to purge out those impurities. So the Lord allows, is what Peter is saying. The Lord allows these adversities in our lives. The Lord allows these trials into our life. It is Malachi, the third chapter and the third verse that says this, and he shall sit, this speaking of God, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. This verse puzzled some women who were having a Bible study, and they wondered what this statement meant and how it described for them the very character of God. One of the women offered to find out the process of refining silver and get back to the group at their next Bible study. That week, the woman called the silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work, and she didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held that piece of silver over the fire, and he let that piece of silver heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold that silver in the middle of the flame where the flame was the hottest, and it would burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding such uh, uh, us in such a hot spot in our life, and she thought again about the verse as it, it's quoted in Malachi chapter 3, he sits as a refiner and a purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there and watch the process the whole time. And the man answered, yes. Not only, had he had, not only did he have to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver, and the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was satisfied with the answer and the accuracy of the Bible. And as she was turning away, the silversmith said, Oh, and ma'am... There's one more thing you should know. The only way that I know that the silver is complete is when I see my image in it. And what a wonderful picture we have of the refining of God in our life. As he's trying to draw out that dross and dirt and impurities so that his image is seen in our life. A clay pot sitting in the sun will always be a clay pot. It has to go through the white heat of the furnace to become porcelain. And so the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. At the age of six, Daniel fell off some playground equipment and he hit his head on the ground. Fearing that there might be a concussion, his aunt, who was a nurse, woke him up throughout the night. Each hour, she would gently wake up Daniel and say to him, what is your name? By the middle of the night, Daniel was tired of all the interruptions that was happening. When his aunt came in at, three, uh, when his aunt came in at five in the morning, he saw something strange on Daniel's forehead. 
As she looked closer, it was a piece of paper. And written with crayon, stuck to his forehead, was the answer, my name is Daniel. <laughs> Life is filled with those interruptions. And yet it's a wonderful blessing to know that it is God who is watching over us. It is God who is caring for us. And God allows these trials, these fiery trials, to come into our life, but they are but for a purpose. They are but for God's purposes in our life so that we would be more like him. I see in this passage of Scripture that adversity is expected in the life of a Christian, but I think also there's another important truth to this in Philippians chapter 1, in that adversity is the proof of salvation. Notice what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 28. If you could look at this verse here together. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 28. Now the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at, at Philippi, they were going through some adversity. They were going through some trouble and some trials. And so he writes to them in Philippians 1 and verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. You know, unfortunately, I hate to say this, but unfortunately, all over this world today, Christians are suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ. Christians are being afflicted. Christians are being persecuted. And Paul reminds the church at Philippi that their adversity in preaching the gospel is proof that they have the truth and that they are indeed of God. Jesus said that because he faced tribulation, because he faced affliction, that we would also face tribulation because we are of God. Jesus said the servant is not greater than his master. And so we find in this passage of Scripture this wonderful truth here of the commonality of trials, trials, afflictions in the life of a Christian can be expected. And Peter said, don't think it's strange when these afflictions come into our life. I want us to think about number two, the commendation of the Christian. The commendation of the Christian in verse 13. Now, we know that there is indeed victory in identifying with Christ. Look what the Bible says in our text here in verse 13. It says, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. We must not place our confidence in ourself, but trust in God's grace and God's enablement to help us through the trials of our life. You know, in Muhammad Ali's heyday as the heavyweight champion in boxing, he had taken a seat on a 747, which was starting to taxi down the runway to take off. The flight attendant walked by and noticed Ali and did not have, uh, that he did not have on his seatbelt, and he said to him in a nice, kind, gentle voice, please fasten your seatbelt, sir, we're about to take off. He looked up proudly and snapped at the young lady and said, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt, lady. And the woman, without hesitation, said to that man, Superman doesn't need a plane either. Buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> the reality is this, there are no superhumans. As Christians, we are all human. And we all hurt. We all have disappointments. We all get frustrated. 
And we feel these emotions throughout our life, throughout our ministry, in raising our children, in our workplace. All of these emotions can take place. And, and the reality as we study the life of Jesus Christ, and as we study the suffering of Jesus, we are taught, and, and the Bible gives us such great detail of what Jesus suffered. It, it teaches us that our troubles and our trials and our afflictions are bearable through his help in our life. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews, if we could, in the 12th chapter, Hebrews chapter 12. Look what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 12, and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 12, and verse number 1, it's a familiar passage. The Bible says it this way, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. If you feel hurt, Christian, if you feel disappointed, if you feel frustrated in your life, then I want to encourage you this morning to think about Jesus. You see, Jesus endured the cross of shame. The Bible says in verse 2 of Hebrews 12 that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Like Job, Jesus suffered public and private shame. Of course, the Lord's was so much that that even public shame, that that it would be an incredible amount of suffering on his part. And yet the Bible says that Jesus endured. And we can also endure through his power and help in our life. The Bible also says that Jesus endured the contradiction of sinners. In verse 3 of our text, contradiction, it's the idea of gainsaying and the idea of opposition. Those who who, uh, opposed the Lord Jesus and ridiculed the Lord Jesus. The Bible, see, the Bible says that Jesus endured the ridicule. He endured the cursing. He endured the fa- fa- uh, false accusations. He endured the slander. He endured the mocking. He, he endured all of this. The hatred that was given to him undeserved. The Bible says he endured the contradiction of sinners. The reality is there is victory in the presence of God. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, back to our text, the Bible says this, verse 14, notice it together. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory, look at this, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. You know, peace and victory are not found in the absence of trouble. It's found in the presence of God in our life. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Contrary to what might be expected, 
I look back on the experiences at the time seemed especially uh, desolating and painful with particular satisfaction, someone writes. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I learned in my 75 years in this world, a Christian says, everything that was truly enhanced and enlightened my experiences has been through a Affliction, and not through happiness. In adversity, we usually want God to do a removing job. But God wants to do an improving job in our life. As His Spirit rests upon us, we can glorify God in our time of adversity. And so we see in this passage of Scripture these wonderful truths, the commendation of the Christian is to be glorified and to glorify God through the troubles of our life. But I want us to look at, lastly, and I'll be done here, the caution to the Christian and verse number 15. All of this is important, but all of it has to be taken in context. The Bible says, look at the Bible, says this in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 15. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other man's business. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. I think there's an important caution here that we have to understand. I'll let the Bible speak for itself here. We have to be careful to avoid self-imposed suffering. Self-imposed suffering. We noted before that not all suffering is a fiery trial from the Lord. And Peter warns against sin, which really nullifies the witness of suffering. Even Bible greats that we read about in the Word of God, like Abraham and David and Peter, suffered for their sin. And the Bible teaches us that if any man suffer for, as a murderer, if any man suffer for thievery, if any man suffer for evil doing, if any man suffer for a busybody, you could throw on the label that you're suffering for a Christian, as a Christian, but that is not Christ-like. And you're not suffering because you're being like Jesus. Look what the Bible says in chapter 3 of 1 Peter. We could turn back a few pages here. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 14. Look what the Bible says here in verse 14. It says, But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you for your good conversation in Christ. Here's what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible is teaching us live like a Christian. And if you are attacked, if you cause or are, are facing affliction because of your Christian life. The reality is if you are called an evildoer, if you're attacked and slandered, the reality is your conscience is number one. Laying your head on the pillow at night and knowing you're right with God is the key. And the Bible teaches us that they might be ashamed that falsely accuse you because of the life that you live for the Lord Jesus. I heard the story of a small boy in Korea. A small boy in Korea who was a household, uh, a house boy, they would call it, for the GIs in the country. And they would take this little boy and they would tease him and they would string his shoes together and they would give him a hard time every single day. And they would lock him out of the house. And I mean, just, just gave him a terrible time. And finally came the day that 
that they apologized to him. And they said that they were sorry. And the boy said, that's okay. The boy says, I stopped spinning in your soup now. <laughs> the reality is, is sometimes we can face affliction and sometimes we can face persecution, but it's not because we're acting Christ-like. It's because we're acting carnal. And we can't throw the tag on that, that we're suffering for Jesus when we're suffering because of our own pleasures and desires. The Bible teaches us that not all persecution is because we're acting like Jesus. And so avoid self-imposed suffering. Our key in the Christian life is not to look for persecution. It's to live godly. And if persecution comes, then so be it. But the reality is our focus and purpose in our life is to be like Jesus and to live like Jesus. And then we see not only to avoid self-imposed suffering, but to honor Christ. Honor Christ when suffering for his sake. Now know what Peter had to say about suffering for the cause of Christ. He gave us some important truths here. When suffering comes, when affliction comes, he says, first of all, don't be ashamed of Christ. You know, it's interesting that Peter is writing this because there was a time in Peter's life he was ashamed. There was a time in Peter's life that he faced affliction in his life when a damsel girl said, hey, you're a disciple. And Peter said, no, I'm not. There was a time in Peter's life that he was ashamed of the Lord and now he is strengthening the brethren as Jesus told him when he was converted or turned around and he says here in this passage of Scripture that when we, seek, when we face affliction in our life, we are to seek to glorify God. We're to seek to glorify God. To not be ashamed. Not be ashamed in those moments of affliction. But to glorify the Lord. It was this, that, this determination that Paul had when he came to Rome or desired to go to Rome and to preach the gospel. It was Paul that said in Romans 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It was Paul that wrote to Timothy, a young preacher, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Don't be ashamed of your testimony in the Lord Jesus. And don't be ashamed of Christ. But also glorify God on the behalf of Christ. We may suffer in the name of Christ, but we ought to bring glory to His name. And it's truly a blessing. It is truly a blessing when we have the opportunity to bring glory to God. Roman law required each citizen to pledge his loyalty to the emperor. And once a year, a Roman citizen would have to pinch of in, would put a pinch of incense on the proper altar and they would say these words, Caesar is Lord. But the Christian would not do that. A Christian would not bow a knee to Caesar because Jesus Christ is Lord. And because of that stand, they would face great persecution. Because of that stand, they would be outcasts in their society. And yet God gave them grace to glorify God in the time of affliction in their life. And so I ask you this question this morning, are you identifying with Christ? And are you bringing glory to God in the adversities that you face? I'm here to tell you there's victory over sin through the cross. And there's victory over affliction to the power of the cross. And you can have victory in Jesus today. You can know today. You can know today. You can have confidence today 
as you follow the Lord. But let me ask you this other question here this morning. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Are you sure that you're a Christian? Are you sure that heaven is your eternal home? I hope so today. And if not, I believe God brought you here today to be saved. He wants you to trust in Him. He wants you to have the hope of your sins forgiven and a home in heaven. Christian, God help us today to live for the Lord and to glorify God in the afflictions that we face.